Uh, my apologies to the uh, uh, folks in the uh, working upstairs. I, I do not recall the text that I have given to you, but I have looked at the Bible and have decided on the text. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how, if this is going to work with you, but I was thinking about beginning from verse 16 of John 3 and going to the end of the chapter. I'm not sure if that's what I originally gave you, but I think what I originally gave you may be longer than I'd like to read. So if you can set that up, fine. If not, we, we have Bibles. Uh, you can certainly feel free to turn in, in the Bible to John 3.16. John 3.16, and I'd like to uh, read through verse 21. Don't hear any more pages wrestling, so I'll assume we're all there. John 3, beginning in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. But he who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Let me just mention at the outset that, um, you know, the Gospel of John, that's, that's usually where we ask people who are first coming to Christ, we tell them, read the Gospel of John. And why do we tell them to read John? But except we, we believe it to be so simple, so easy to understand, and yet as I read John, I find him to be the most difficult one to understand. You can certainly see the mark of, of John's personality, his writing, in what he expresses in, in Scripture. Not everything he says is that easy to understand, even though it's written quite simply, with simple vocabulary, simple words. And actually, we might think that John 3.16 is fairly straightforward, and we, that we understand it fairly well, but as we look through the rest of the Gospel of John, we find out that maybe John isn't meaning to say or at least Jesus is not saying what we might think he says on the surface with regard to God's love for the world. Is it a love for the whole world, for each and every individual in the world? Or is he talking about a, you know, a love that, that is centered upon a particular group of individuals? One thing we are going to see, let me just give you in, this in summary, certainly God's love for the world in, in, in a broad sense gives everyone at least, well, again, I have to back up from that because it doesn't actually give everyone the opportunity to hear the gospel. There are people who are going to live and die, who have lived and died, who have never heard the gospel. Certainly the Lord isn't telling us that everybody is going to hear this. So it can't necessarily mean that. But for those who are alive today and, and to whom the gospel will go, God's love certainly does provide that everyone gets to hear it. But we do know that his love does not provide that everyone will necessarily receive it, that God has a specific and an electing love where he actually chooses out from fallen mankind those whom he will save. And we're going to see something about that this evening. Now, again, this is a huge subject. I'm not going to be able to answer all the questions that might arise from this, but we'll certainly get, I hope, a fairly good look at it. And the reason why we're taking a break, as it were, which is not really a break, uh, from the series on the Ten Commandments is simply because there's been some buzz on Facebook regarding um, the love of God, at least in, in our small circles. Specifically, whether or not God loves unbelievers or what we might call the non-elect or the goats in the same way that he loves uh, his sheep or those who are his elect or the believers or those actually who are going to eventually believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Whether there's any difference between these, whether God accepts everybody as they are and loves everybody equally or not, whether he sends his son to die for everyone or not, whether or not God has a special love 
for some. And that, well, basically that moved him to send his son for them. Now, again, that's what I'd like to just take a break to address, although we're not really taking a break, as you've already heard. So let's just kick the subject off, and actually we are going to conclude this evening as well, from this particular text. And let me just say, to answer any question like this, anything that has to do with God, anything that has to do with what God is like, anything to do with what God has planned, anything that has to do with God, with what God wants us to do, there's only one place we can go for the answer. I hope you understand. We have to go to the scriptures because this is the only verbal revelation that God has given to us, notwithstanding those who believe that revelation continues today, verbal revelation continues today through the continuance of the charismatic gifts. Uh, we don't believe that that is the case, and even if it were the case, he would not contradict what he's already said. This is the standard. There's a nonverbal revelation in creation that tells us that God is, tells us certain things about him, but this is where we need to go. In other words, the opinions that people have are just opinions unless they agree with God's word. And when we go to the scriptures, we also have to, to look at what the whole of scripture says, and not just random passages. And of course, you know, different people who differ on this issue are going to point the finger at each other and say, well, that's just what those particular texts seem to be saying, but we've got texts that say something else. We do have to take scripture as a whole and not just take certain random texts and put together a theology or some, something that we say, well, this is what the Bible teaches because of these verses when we're actually not understanding those verses as they are. So certainly, we want to take all of Scripture and we want to go to those places which are clearest. Interestingly, most of the passages I'm going to be quoting this evening come from the Gospel of John, which are quite clear on the subject and sometimes shockingly so. You wonder why there's really any disagreement on the issue. So what we want to look at this evening again is God's love for his people and we want to see what God's love is for those whom the scripture tell us are not his people. Let's begin with the passage that uh, we're looking at, the classic passage that is used probably more than any other for evangelism, John 3.16. Jesus here is having a conversation with Nicodemus. And in his conversation, he says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Now again, what could be more simple than this passage? Seems simple, at least on the surface. Many professing Christians believe that it is simple, but really it's not as simple as you think. There's a few questions that we need to ask regarding what John, or actually what Jesus is actually saying, in this passage, and we do need to understand at the outset that we may not agree on the answers to the questions that we're going to ask. For instance, what does Jesus referring to, what is he referring to here by the word world? This world that God is said so to love that he gives his son for it. Well, it can mean at least four things, and probably if we thought a little longer, we could come up with even more. First, it certainly can mean the whole world. Sometimes the world is used to refer to the world. Each and every individual in the world who has ever lived, regardless of nationality. And this is the way that many people understand this passage today. Jesus would be saying that God so loved everyone who has ever existed that he gave his son in order that they might at least have a chance of being saved. Now again, most people believe that. There's reasons why I, I don't believe that that's true, and we'll get into some of that as we go along. But again, because of our limited time, we'll have to sort of be a bit more specific. Now secondly, it can refer, and often does refer, to both Jews and Gentiles, as opposed to Jews only. And you know that John uses the word oftentimes in that sense. In this case, Jesus is, is saying to Nicodemus, that God's love for the world is so great that it extends beyond the Jews, even to the furthest reaches of the world, to the Gentiles as well. 
So it's for all kinds of people and not just for Jews. And that's pretty consistent with the first understanding. Now thirdly, and this is where we're beginning to get a little discriminating here and perhaps where we differ uh, as a denomination from other believers, it can refer to God's elect among the people who live in the world. Those whom God has chosen eternally to save. And basically the text would be saying this, that God so loved the world that he gave his son for those who by his grace would trust his son from both Jews and Gentiles. And that those he would secure by his grace, they would not perish but have eternal life. Or, of course, it could be referring specifically to the elect among the Gentiles, and that would be that Jesus is telling Nicodemus that God's love for the world is so great that, again, God has not only those among his Jews, but his love extends to all the nations, not just to the Jews, though it wouldn't exclude the Jews, but to those who for so long have been alienated from God. So, again, the idea each and every individual uh, Gentiles as well as Jews, the emphasis perhaps being on Gentiles, the elect among the Jews and the Gentiles, or perhaps referring to the fact that God has his people among the Gentiles, his elect. Now, which of these does Jesus mean? Now, here's, here's where I think we need to make a bit of a, a distinction. One thing I want us to understand, and I've already mentioned this, is we're not denying, no, nobody I think would deny that the gospel that God has provided is, has been, well, given in such a way that he may offer it freely to everyone indiscriminately. But we do need to understand that God has a discriminating love. He has a choice that he has made. He has his people that he sent his son into the world for. And I, I do believe as we look at the results of what he sent his, work, his son into the world to do, that we see some of that discrimination. First of all, let's consider what it is that his love moved him to do for the world. And again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. This love of God for the world moved him to give his son for the world. Now, to give his son that his son might do what? Well, look at verse 16, that he might keep them from perishing. Verse 17, that he might save them. Again, verse 16, that they might have eternal life. Now, for whom did Jesus do this? Whom did he save? Whom did he give eternal life? Everyone in the world? Well, obviously not, but he did it for a specific group of people called his sheep. These are the elect. These are his chosen ones. Now Jesus says, and here's where we get into, um, well, especially the, the, what we call the, the Good Shepherd Discourse in John chapter 10, verse 11. And perhaps, um, perhaps you might want to turn up John chapter 10 because we're going to be looking at several verses in that particular chapter. Gospel of John chapter 10. Again, we see some discrimination here. And again, discrimination is used kind of in a negative sense. I don't want you to think that God's doing anything negatively, but we do see him doing things specifically for these who are called his sheep. In this particular chapter, Jesus calls himself the good shepherd. The sheep are those who are his people. What is it that the good shepherd does for his sheep? Well, look at verse 11. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Okay, for, so who is it that Jesus lays his life down for? Well, he lays it down for the sheep, the sheep specifically. Now, he also says in verse 28, regarding the sheep, and I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Here again, we see that these sheep, that are being referred to for whom Jesus gives his life. The result is they do not perish, but he gives them eternal life, and no one can snatch them out of his hand. Sounds very consistent to me with John 3.16, for 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now something that, that may surprise you, and I hope it doesn't at this point surprise you, although it would if you don't come from this background, if you come from broad evangelicalism, it will surprise you. What, what I'm saying already is that not everyone in the world is a part of Christ's sheep. Not everyone is one of his sheep. Now, how do we know that? Because Jesus said to those Jews, I hope you're still in John chapter 10, who did not believe in him, that the reason why they did not believe in him was because they were not of his sheep. Is everybody a part of a sheep? Not everybody. There are those who are not of a sheep. Where do we see that? John chapter 10, verses 24 through 26. Verses 24 through 26. The Jews then gathered around him, were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, these testify of me. Now notice this sentence. But you do not believe, because you are not of my sheep. Now again, notice what Jesus is saying here, and notice what he isn't saying. He is not saying, you're not of my sheep because you haven't yet believed. If you just simply believed, you would be a part of my sheep. That's not what Jesus means here. That's not what he's saying at all, is it? But what he is saying is that they didn't believe. They saw the works. They heard what Jesus claimed regarding himself, but they didn't believe because they were not of his sheep which means they didn't believe because it wasn't the Lord's intention to give them the grace to believe because they were not of his sheep, the ones for whom Jesus Christ laid down his life. Now Jesus goes on to say in verses 27 and 28, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Now Jesus is saying to those Jews that would not believe that if they had been of his sheep, they would have listened to him. They would have believed in him. They would have followed him. But because they're not of his sheep, they would not believe. You know, there are those in the Bible that are called sheep, and there are those who are called goats. And basically, that is the division of the whole human race in terms of those whom the Lord deals with in this way and those whom he does not deal with. And that's why at the end, on the day of judgment, they're going to be gathered and, and separated into these two groups. By the way, there's again so many differences between different churches, I, I should explain. We do believe that there's only one judgment, one general judgment of all mankind when all who are living when Jesus returns along with all who have died, will be gathered together in one place at one time to be judged and finally separated between heaven and hell. And the two groups of people that will be there on that day are the sheep and the goats. The sheep are those who trusted in Jesus Christ. They are those who did the works of Christ. They are those who loved his people and ministered to them inasmuch as you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. And the goats are those who will not have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and who will not have served his people the way the sheep did. Now, who among these are going to receive eternal life? Well, obviously, the sheep are. The righteous, he says, will go into eternal life. And the goats, well, these will go away into eternal punishment. The point is, not everyone is a sheep, obviously. The sheep are those Jesus lays down his life for, those to whom he gives eternal life, those who will never perish, those who are going to live forever. They are those, even, even more specifically, that the Father has given to Jesus. Now look at verse 29 of John chapter 10. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So who are these sheep? Well, besides what 
Jesus, you know, what we know of them as far as what Jesus actually does for them, these are the ones the Father gives to Jesus. And we know from the rest of Scripture, if we had a little time to, to look into it, these are the elect. These are the ones whom he has chosen from before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the reward that the Father is giving to his Son for his work of redemption, for coming into the world in order to save, to do this work to save them. These are his reward. So basically... John 3.16, I believe, is saying something to this effect. That God's love was so great that it moved him to give his son to save his people from perishing and to give them eternal life. And again, if we answer this, ask this question, is everyone in the world a sheep? Well, we have to ask this question in order to answer that question. Is everyone in the world saved? Because the sheep are those whom he lays down his life for, whom he gives eternal life, the sheep are the ones who will never perish. No, not everybody in the world is saved. But Christ's sheep are saved. And these are the ones, again, the Father gives the Son for his work of redemption. Now, again, going back to John 3.16 again, I want you to notice, secondly, who it is that actually receives this salvation. And this is something we all agree on in the churches. There is only one way to receive what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, and that is faith. Jesus says in our passage, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now it is interesting that in the Greek, the word there, who, whoever or whosoever, depending on your particular translation, is literally everyone. I mean, everyone who believes. And it means, it's, it's saying essentially this, that God's love for the world was so great that he gave his son so that everyone who believes should not perish but have eternal life. There is the big you know, difference between whoever and everyone, but I think everyone does tend to make it a little bit clearer that God, it's saying to the, basically this, that God's love for the world was so great that he gave his son so that Everyone who actually believes in him will be saved and will not perish. But again, we ask the question, who is it that will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we've already answered that question. Only Christ's sheep. Remember what Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 and 28. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish. And then he says to the Jews who didn't believe, you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. So who is it that is going to be saved? Those who believe. Who is it that's going to believe? Those who are Christ's sheep. Why are they going to believe? Well, if we had time, we'd look more deeply into this. But the reason why they believe is because Jesus lays his life down for them. Because he sends his spirit, it gives his spirit, even as he told Nicodemus earlier in this, in this chapter. Unless you're born again of the spirit, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The, the wind blows where it wills. You hear the sound of it, but don't know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. The flesh profits nothing, he says in John chapter 6. It is the spirit who gives life. So who is it that's going to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? It's the sheep because the Spirit of God changes their hearts, makes them spiritually alive and able to believe. That's why the sheep alone believe and why the Jews who didn't believe in Jesus Christ, how Jesus knew plainly they were not of his sheep because if they had been, they would hear his voice because the Spirit would be working in their hearts. They would follow him, but they are not following him. They do not believe. So whom did God send his son into the world to save? Not just Jews, but Gentiles. And he may have been referring primarily to the Gentiles here without excluding the Jews. But not everyone in the world. It was for Christ's sheep that he came to lay down his life. For those who would believe. For those who would receive him again by his grace. 
for those who would never perish because he had given to them eternal life. By the way, this, I think, opens up this text when Gabriel comes to Joseph. And Joseph is wondering, well, you know, this gal I'm engaged to. Uh, she's expecting a child, and, you know, there's only one way you can uh, conceive. She must have been unfaithful, so he was thinking about putting her away. But then Gabriel, the angel, comes to him and tells him not to put her away because the one conceived in Mary's womb is very special. This is what he says regarding Jesus. Matthew 1.21, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. Now, is Gabriel telling uh, Joseph that this one who is coming into the world is going to save the whole world, each and every individual? No. He's coming into the world to save his people. And notice that they are his people coming into the world. He comes into the world to save a specific group of people called his people. These are the sheep. These are, again, God's elect. They don't become his people. They don't become his sheep by believing. But because they are his people, because they are his sheep, they are given grace in order that they might believe. God's love was so great for those that he had chosen that even when there was nothing at all good in them but only evil, he gave his only begotten son that they might not perish but have eternal life. That is what I believe is behind what Jesus is saying here when he says, for God so loved the world it's been pointed out that the world often has a very evil connotation. The world is fallen and under the power of the evil one, and we were children of wrath, even as the rest. But God's love was so great that it moved him to give his son, even while we were yet his enemies, that we might have eternal life, that we might not perish. Paul says to the believers at Rome that that very thing in chapter 5, verse 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The word world there is used to refer to Jews and Gentiles. It is, I believe, because of the context, the Lord is narrowing it down to the elect, but the word world is used because it's talking about what we were like when God sent his son. We were infinitely uh, atrocious, abominable in his sight because of our sins. And yet he was willing to give us his own son. Now, another thing I need to just point out really quickly is that people, you know, many, many Christians will read this passage in Romans 5, 8, and they will apply this to the entire world. God demonstrates his own love toward us, toward mankind, toward the whole world, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But you need to remember that Paul did not write the letter of Romans to the world. It was addressed to a church, a church full of saints, those who had trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, to a people who had received the gospel. It's not addressed to the person who lives down the street who's hooked on drugs and is drunk. I mean, not, not necessarily. Uh, just because, again, of this, it's, this was addressed to a church. Again, people believe the New Testament letters are addressed to the world at large, but that isn't the case. They were written to believers. This applies to them. Now, again, we do have to remember that even though God sent his son into the world specifically to die or to lay down his life for his sheep and that those sheep will trust him and he gives eternal life to them and they will never perish, it does not mean, as we're going to see, that God did not give his son so that everyone who hears the gospel may have the opportunity to be saved. Uh, God is so gracious, we're going to see in just a moment here, boy, time is getting away from us, that he does love or he, he gives a certain kind of love to unbelievers, even offering them the gospel and the opportunity to be saved, which we're going to see, of course, they will reject because of their sins. Now, as we move into this next section, I do want to point this out, that we are going to look at a description of what the Bible says that we are like apart from the grace of God. That is what uh, the goats are like always throughout the time they come into the world to the time they leave. But this is also what we were like before the Lord gave us his grace. And so as we, as we look at what the goats are like, understand that that's what you were like 
And that's what's contained in this word world and this great love of God in giving his son for us when we were in that condition. Now let's ask the second question. We've seen what God's like is, uh, his love is like for the elect, for his sheep, for his people. Does that mean that God doesn't love everyone else, those who are not his sheep? Does this mean that he doesn't love the goats? Well, I hope you understand by this time, it's certainly clear that he doesn't love them in the same way that he loves his sheep. The sheep are those whom he's going to welcome into heaven, those whom he's prepared a place for um, and is going to dwell with them forever, but the goats are those he's going to cast into hell. There's a clear difference between them. But on the other hand, we might be surprised by what God says in his word, his, his, his love actually moves him to do, even for the goats. And now here's where I want us just to think about this. Remembering who the goats are, it reminds us again of the greatness of God's love. Because the goats are those that the Lord is ultimately going to pass over in his mercy which the Bible tells us God may very justly do when you consider what they are like, what it is they have done, and against whom they have done it. And again, I just want to remind you that we did these same things, and we were a part of the same human race, and we were just as, as wicked as they are. You and I came into the world as children of wrath, we were under God's wrath. We were, we were actually heading in that direction, but it was God's mercy and grace that intervened that turned us around, and that again shows us the infinite love that God has for his people and giving his son for people like this while we were his enemies. So what are the goats like? Well, we already know that far from listening to Jesus' voice as the sheep will do and following him out of love for him, they hate God. They hate Jesus Christ. They hate the Father. That's why when you go out and you evangelize them, you have some trouble trying to get them to accept what you're having to say because by nature, they hate the one you're presenting to them. And that's what we did prior to God's mercy upon us. Well, Jesus said to his disciples in John 15, again in the Gospel of John, verse 18 and verses 23 through 24, he says, if the world hates you, by the way, by the, the world here, he's referring to unconverted people. You know that it has hated me before it hated you. And then the verse 23, he who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. So what are the goats like? What are unconverted people like? They hate God. They hate Jesus Christ. Now isn't there anything good in them? Isn't there even the least little spark of goodness by which they can reach out to Jesus Christ and receive him, at least want him to some degree when he's offered to them? Well, actually the Bible says no. There is nothing good in them at all Paul, commenting on the human race, says in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 18, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Is there anything good in the unconverted? Paul says, absolutely not. Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 8 that they are in the flesh. They have nothing of the Spirit of God. They are hostile toward God. They refuse to submit to him. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 6 through 8. For the mind set on the flesh is death. By the way, he's talking here about those who have nothing of the Spirit, those apart from the grace of God, 
This is the unbeliever. This is what he's like. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So is there a spark of goodness in all mankind that they can receive Jesus Christ when he's offered to them? No, they can't subject themselves to the law of God. They're hostile toward God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Jesus said in John chapter 6, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. Jesus goes on to say that no one can come to me except the Father who sent me draws them. And he does that by his Holy Spirit. Well, it shouldn't surprise us then that the goats, the unbelievers, refuse to come to Jesus Christ that they might be saved. Remember what I read in John chapter 3, connected to the same passage about God's love for sending his son into the world. He says this in verses 19 and 20. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So just in summary, every unbeliever, according to the scripture, hates the Father, hates Jesus, refuses to submit to God, will not come to the Son in order that they might have salvation. Why does anybody come to Christ if this is the way unbelievers are? Well, again, it's because of the work of the Spirit of God. Those whom the Father gives me, Jesus says, he will draw them to me. The Spirit breathes where he wills, and he creates this newness of life. But God, in his mercy, while you were dead in your trespasses and sins, made you alive. He made you alive by his Holy Spirit. Now, one thing we don't want to forget about is the fact that, that God is actively restraining the wickedness of men in this world so that we don't really see what they are like. And we look at these descriptions of fallen mankind. We look at the world around us and we say, hey, my neighbor's kind of a nice person. You know, sometimes he offers to help me do this and that. And sometimes, you know, he's doing nice things for me. How can he be the way that God says he is? Well, if he's not trusting in Jesus, that is the way he is. That's what the Bible says. The reason why he's not as bad as he could be is because God is restraining his sin. So don't let that confuse you into thinking that your neighbor who is unconverted is anything other than what God says that he is. And remember that that is what you were like before God had mercy upon you. And this shows, again, the depths of God's love that he was willing while you were a part of the world, to send his son into the world so that you might have everlasting life, so that you might not perish. That is the depth of his love. Now, these are the goats. Does God love them? Does God love those who are not of his sheep, those whom he's not going to show mercy, those whom he's not going to save? Well, there is a certain sense in which God does show what we would consider to be a kind of love, but we have to be careful how we define this. God is, is good. He is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. And we might say that he is because he is infinite love and it's his nature to give. Now, how is his love then displayed toward even the goats? Well, think about what scripture says. God made them. God sustains them. And he did that even knowing what they would be like. He still created them. He still sustains them. He still takes care of them. Every good thing that they receive in life comes from him. God's love is, is, is great. It's so great that he shows this kindness and mercy. As a matter of fact, his mercy goes so far as even commanding that the gospel be preached even to them, knowing full well that they're not going to receive it. It doesn't mean that God doesn't intend it well, even though they're going to reject it. Sometimes we, you know, we certainly, we, we try to reach out to others. We try to give the gospel to them. And if they reject it, it doesn't mean that we didn't mean well. It doesn't mean we weren't trying to love God. We weren't trying to love them. 
It's still an act of love. Now, can we call this love? Well, yes, we can, but we do need to understand what kind of love this is. These are acts of kindness that God gives to even his enemies. It comes from his infinite love to those who deserve judgment. Now, we call this kind of love a love of benevolence, which simply means that God, out of his infinite love, gives good things to those who don't deserve it because he is good. Now, we do need to distinguish this kind of love from what people often mistake God's love to be, what we call a love of complacency, and perhaps we're unfamiliar with these terms. I'm just using it because they've been used historically. Benevolence means to will well towards someone, to do something nice for them. Complacency, though, means to love something because in and of itself it's beautiful and it's worthy to be loved. Now, the love that God shows the unbeliever is not a love of complacency. The unbeliever is not lovely to him at all. But it's a love of benevolence. It's a benevolent love. He gives them good things because he is good. His love of complacency is reserved for his son. By the way, that love, as you know, is, is again, the spirit of God. That is the love the Father has for the Son, Son for the Father. We can't really get into that. But this love of complacency, this love that God has for his son, because he looks at his son and he sees in his son his perfect image, is the love that God has for his son alone, but also for those, you might say, who are in the son, those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, remember, that before you came to Christ, you were described by what we saw in Scripture as hating God, hating Jesus Christ, and having nothing good in you at all, and being hostile toward God, and not submitting yourself to God. Before you came to Christ, God loved you, but he loved you in this way of benevolence. He was good to you, even though you were evil. But now that you are in his son, he loves you in the same way that he loves his son. In Christ, you are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, all his good works, everything he's done. And all your sins have been taken away. And so you stand before the Lord as one who, in essence, looks just like his son. And so the Father actually loves you for what he sees in you. He sees an actual moral beauty. He sees that moral beauty of his son. Now again, understand the difference between these two kinds of love. God has the love of benevolence toward the unbeliever. He has a love of complacency only towards those who are believing in the Lord Jesus Christ because they are in his son. Understanding the difference between these two kinds of love, I think can help us understand how God can still be kind toward the wicked and yet be said in scripture to hate the wicked the Bible says in Psalm 5, 5, 5 that you hate all who do iniquity. Well, who all does iniquity that God hates? Well, those people described by their hostility toward God, their unwillingness to submit to God, the fact that they don't seek after God, the fact that they hate God and they hate his son, those are the ones who, who do iniquity. Well, God hates them. Well, how can God hate them and yet still show them his love? Well, you can do that. You see, because his love is not drawn out by the object, because the object is hateful, abominable in his sight, wicked. God, you know, is to, of too pure eyes to approve evil. And yet he can still show kindness to them. Certainly that makes sense. It also makes sense out of the fact that God is said in Romans 1 verse 18 to be pouring out his wrath upon mankind every single day. If God loves the whole world in the way that, that many people believe that he loves them, then why does God bring such judgments upon them? How can he love them and, and do these things to them at the same time? And how can God eventually judge them and consign them to hell when he loved them so much? Well, he can do this because he's not in love with them, if I can put it that way. 
I mean, he isn't in love with them. He shows them great kindnesses because of his infinite love, but he doesn't love them in the way that many people think. So he loves them. Oh, I'm, I'm in love with them, and I can't bear the thought that they're going to perish. Now, I want you to understand this because the Lord actually calls us to love the wicked in precisely the same way that he does, to do exactly the same thing. God calls us to love our enemies. God loves his enemies, and he tells us that we are to love our enemies as well. Listen to what he says or what Jesus says in Luke 6, verses 35 through 36. But love your enemies, and do good, and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Now, is the Lord telling us, if we are to be like him towards our enemies, uh, even as he is towards his enemies, if, if we did understand the love of God to be sort of in love with everyone and to love him in, the, in this idea or the, with this idea of complacency that he actually loves the wicked and can't bear that anything terrible would happen to them. You know, if he loved them in that way, then, or if he asked us to do that, we would basically be put in a position where we look at these people who are hateful and evil and somehow we have to love them for what we see in them. We can't. We can't do that. I mean, when you read in the newspaper about somebody who, who, you know, a couple of young men who beat an elderly man to death. Does that engender love in your heart for those two individuals that did that act? Or the woman, God forbid, who I think it was in China, could have been not necessarily in China, but in Singapore, who actually accosted this little boy, I think he was like six or eight years old, and literally ripped his eyeballs out. And why did she do that? Well, she was going to sell the cornea of his eyeballs on the black market, but she wasn't able to get away with the eyeballs, so the boy was left there with his eyes on the ground. Am I supposed to then be enamored with this woman who would do such a thing to this young boy? Now, I don't think the Lord is telling us that we need to love them in the sense that, that my heart goes out to them because I see in them this, this idea of beauty, but understanding how hateful and wicked they are. In God's eyes and in, in my eyes, I mean, uh, this, the psalmist writes about, do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? I, I hate them with the uttermost hatred. We need to hate sin. But yet at the same time, the Lord would have us show mercy and kindness towards them out of love, the love that is here, not for the object necessarily, but for the Lord, and to do what he tells us to do, to show them mercy and to show them kindness. We are to behave towards them in the same way that God does. I mean, God looks at this woman. God looks at these two young men who did these abominable acts. And yes, God hates them. And God is going to judge them. And yet, if they're his, his chosen, he will bring them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If not, he's going to judge them for those things. And in the meantime, he is showing kindness to them. He's sustaining them. They are, they're alive. They haven't dropped into hell. Every good thing that they get, they don't deserve, but it comes from the gracious hand of God. God is good to all his works. That's what we call God's general love of benevolence, but let's not confuse that with an idea that God loves the wicked in the way that many people think that he might. He's not overcome, as it were, with love and affection for what he sees in them. It's just his infinite love pours out towards them because God is good. I hope you see the difference between those two things. By the way, I, well, let me just mention this, that some have actually taken this distinction between God's love for the sheep and his love for the goats to make them offer the gospel only to the sheep and not to the goats. I hope you understand that that's not what the Lord calls us to do. And how could you tell the difference in the first place? They think they have a way of doing it. I preach the law to them and I see they're convicted. Well, maybe they are the sheep, so I'll offer the gospel to them, but not to those who are not affected by it. No, it doesn't work that way. The Lord, in his infinite mercy, tells us, offer the gospel to everyone. Jesus says in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. 
So the Lord's love towards sinners in Christ is to be proclaimed to everyone under heaven, to the sheep as well as to the goats. Now, here's another thing to bear in mind. Jesus said, my sheep will hear my voice and they will follow me. The goats, the goats aren't going to do this, but the sheep will. Now, the goats are going to do what Jesus said they would do earlier. They're not going to come to light. They don't want their evil to be exposed. God's not holding them back. They're holding themselves back because they're in darkness. They love darkness. They don't like the light. They hate the light. They don't want to come to the light. They're the ones holding themselves back. God isn't holding them back. Let's not mistake this idea that um, God's discriminating love means that he's making people stay out or he's holding them back or put, making them evil. They are evil. He's just not changing their hearts to make them come. They're not coming because they don't want to, and that's why they're culpable for that. But remember as well that as you go out and offer the gospel to everyone, there are the sheep who will hear and will follow. That, by the way, is the confidence that we have that as we go out to evangelize, it's going to have an effect. They're not all goats out there. They're not all going to attack you. They're not all going to hate you. There are going to be those who will hear the voice of the shepherd and they will receive the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our confidence. I want you to understand the greatest evangelists who have ever lived believed what I am, te what I'm, you know, well, what the Bible is saying here, what I'm, what I'm you know, explaining to you this evening. They believed in God's sovereignty. They believed that he alone could change hearts. They believed that he had this specific group of people that he was intending on doing that with, and they went out with the confidence that he was going to do that. And they were the ones who actually saw people converted. Now, I'm not saying that those who have a different view never have seen people converted, or they don't go out as well. But the greatest evangelists who've ever lived, the Apostle Paul, George Whitfield, were, were Calvinists. Some people think Calvinism or the idea that God is sovereign means that you're not going to evangelize. It's just the other way around. Those who understand that God is going to do this work have the confidence to go out and evangelize. If God didn't do this work, if we didn't have this confidence and people were what we read them in Scripture to be, then we would have absolutely no confidence that anyone would ever receive him because they hate him. God has to change their hearts. Now, in closing, let's just apply this real quickly to our own response to the gospel. What is your response? Have you heard the voice of the great shepherd? Have you begun to follow him? Have you trusted him? Have you turned from your sins? Have you, do, do you love him? Well, according to this text, if these things are true of you, then you are one of Christ's sheep. You are to remember what we saw this morning, and that is that the Lord has given to you infinite love. Jesus laid down his life for you. Jesus communicates his life for you. Jesus has prepared a place in heaven for you. What do you owe him for that mercy? You owe him absolute and complete devotion which is really what the evening series was that we're taking a break from, which isn't really a break. Absolute total consecration to the Lord because of his infinite love towards you. You need to, to realize you did not have the power to do that. You would have been lost forever and cast into hell eventually if the Lord had not intervened and given you his grace. Understand what you owe him and give yourself to him fully. You know, I, certainly, again, as I mentioned in my prayer, at the end of your life, that's the life that you wish you would have lived when you come to the end of your days, when time, you have no more time. When you're standing before the Lord on the day of judgment, that is how you wish you had lived. And certainly, the love that the Lord has shown you calls you to this kind of love. The second lane, let me just apply it in this way. Understand that if you're still standing back and not responding to the voice of the shepherd as he speaks to you through the gospel, if you're still unwilling to come to him because you love the darkness and you're unwilling to give up your sins, you need to understand that you are on your way to eternal destruction. 
Now, if that's the case with you, listen to Jesus Christ as he again offers you the gospel this evening. How does Jesus do that? He does it in one way, through his people, giving that offer of the gospel. Again, Jesus has commissioned his people. He's commissioned us to offer it to all men. And he offers it to you this evening. He says, believe in me. If you do, I will give you eternal life. Trust in me. I will take away your sins. Turn away from your wickedness and follow me. Jesus says, I will give you eternal life and you will never perish. May the Lord grant that you may hear his voice and listen to him and do what it is he calls you to do. May he give you the grace to do that so that you may come out of the darkness and lay hold of the Savior and experience that infinite love that we have been looking at in Scripture. Well, may the Lord grant this mercy and grace. Uh, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard. And I understand we have heard a lot, but hopefully we've understood what we've heard. Let's ask him to take this and show us how we need to apply it this evening.